from Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Olumide Makoli. Good evening. Tonight, police killed two suspected kidnappers in a gun battle in Tambua local government area of Sokoto State. Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, declares results of by-election in 11 states, announces plans to conclude elections in outstanding areas on December the 9th. Six police officers drown after their boat capsized in southern Ijo local government area of Bayelsa while on election duties. Ghanaian, Ghanaians prepare for the polls as President Nana Akufuado faces main rival and former President John Mahama. It's the end of the road for two suspected kidnappers in Sanjina area of Tambuol, local government area of Sokoto State, as they were shot dead in a gun battle with the police. The state police commissioner, Ibrahim Kauje, who confirmed the incident, explains that there's been an upsurge in kidnap for ransom and pockets of robbery in the state, with one of the recent robbery cases leading to the death of one person. He says one of the suspects in the robbery that claimed the life of a victim has been arrested. Four robbery suspects and eight other persons suspected to be kidnappers were also arrested and three AK-47s and a rifle with ammunition were recovered. We have been trailing them because there was a, even a case last two weeks or three weeks there was a case in a Sena whereby you know even the military and the other security agencies went to that forest, that Sena forest, but they couldn't penetrate because that place requires an operation, a tactical operation. So based on that information, our politics have been digging intelligence, SIB, to try to get the information. This information, we are getting them from their own sponsor that they want to operate, that they want to get, uh, they want to ship, get uh, what, rifles for them. So through the informant, now he now came to me and they gave me that information. And that is when, truthfully, they were engaged because all their rifles are loaded. So, and they say this is why they want to operate so that they ship and they went there. As we went there, that is how the whole operation happened. Meanwhile, the military says the Air Force component of Operation Lafia Dole has killed scores of armed bandits in different airstrikes on their hideouts at the Kuduru Forest area of Kaduna State. Military spokesman Major General John Neche said in a statement that the attacks were carried out based on credible intelligence that a group of heavily armed bandits responsible for a previous attack on troops at Ngedi Allah had originated from a camp within the forest. The statement adds that the aircraft also provided air support for ground troops who immediately engaged the bandits and destroyed their storage facilities. Now, in the meantime, the Kwara State Governor, Abdul Rahman Abdul Razak, today led a delegation including three senators from his state to commiserate with the Bonu state government over the last week killing of farmers in the state. The governor commended his Bonu state counterpart, Baba Gana Zulum, for his selflessness in the face of terrorism. On his part, Governor Zulum showed his appreciation to the delegation and declared his commitment to partnerships that will engender the overall development of the nation. And state governors under the aegis of the Nigerian Governors Forum We'll be meeting with President Muhammadu Buhari in the next few days on the state of insecurity in the country. The chairman of the Governor's Forum and Governor of Ekiti State, Kaudi Fayemi, says they hope to relay their views on the way forward and help resolve the spate of killings. He was speaking on our program, Sunday Politics. We believe that we can tackle this, but that we need to deal with this in an unconventional manner. The insurgents are not fighting a symmetrical war. The war that we're dealing with in the Northeast is asymmetrical. You don't even know where the enemies are. They're mostly in the midst of our people. So you cannot use the strategy of a conventional war to deal with this. So you need to improve on intelligence. You need to then link intelligence to military operations in a most effective manner. And you need to work with neighbors because it has become uh, an international war of sorts that involves Chad, Cameroon, Niger, 
And clearly, uh, even though we have a multinational joint tax force, I do not believe that we have been working as cohesively as we should. And that's a position that we hold in the governor's forum as well. Uh, the governor of Borno, our colleague, has been frontal about his position that a lot more needs to be done. The civilian JTF who has been effective needs to be integrated somewhat because they have better intelligence sometimes on what is going on because many of these elements are from Borno State there. And we also believe that the military has become somewhat overwhelmed as far as this insurgency is concerned. And that's understandable. They are involved in internal security now in almost 34 states out of the 36 states in our country. Staying with security and in Niger State, some persons displaced from their homes as a result of bandit activity in their communities are crying for the attention of the state and federal government in addressing their plight. Now, they want the government to help them find lasting solutions to the security challenges in their communities to enable them to return to their homes. Our correspondent, Emperor Simon, reports. This primary school located in Kuta headquarters of Shiro local government provides shelter for internally displaced persons. Some of them have been here since November 2019. Well, we have not been sleeping with a lot of kidnapping, killing here and there in the Shiro local government. Many of the victims in this camp have lost their loved ones to bandits and the memory still lingers as they call for lasting solution to the security challenges in their communities to enable them to return home. They killed my son and Malam Saidu. In Kukoki community, they killed at least 21 persons. They've also killed several others in other communities. The bandits entered my house on several occasions. They killed my son, leaving his two wives as widows. The wives were just delivered of babies. But we are glad the government has given us shelter. With increasing number of IDPs on the camp, meeting their needs can be very challenging, especially health care provision. This has led to a donation of relief materials to the displaced persons. Uh, we don't have enough drugs. And uh, we have been written a series of letters through the in charge of clinic so that the government should come into the aid of these people. Uh, just last month, uh, our brothers who are displaced in the uh, Basa community, they run down here because there was an outbreak there, uh, cholera. So they came here uh, to the quick intervention of the LG. I think they sent some drugs there and they curtailed the, the spread of that uh, disease. We realized that there is a shortage of food items in the, at the camps, and this is a, a, a we are into a cold weather now. I will provide cloth for the, uh, some of the children, and also we will provide uh, a, a jelly and some drugs to the uh, pharmacy they have here in the IDP camps. Since the renewed banditry attacks in Niger State, at least 100 persons have been killed and thousands displaced from their homes. Authorities here claim they are on top of the situation, but these victims only hope for the day when they can go to bed within the comfort of their homes. Emperor Simon, Channel Television News. Also concerning security matters, for four consecutive years since 2015, Nigeria has emerged the third most impacted country in the world by terrorism after Iran and Afghanistan, and that's according to the 2019 Global Terrorism Index. An update to the report in 2020 shows a general decline as deaths from terrorism reach a five-year low. But in spite of this, Afghanistan and Nigeria are the only two countries to have persistently experienced one more than a thousand deaths from terrorism. Our correspondent Gloria Mizuke examines this trend. Hundreds of families, particularly in the Northeast, have shared similar fates attacked, killed, and displaced. Since 2009, the grim reality of terrorism in the country have prevailed. 
compelling images of destruction, death and unprecedented kidnapping of over 200 young girls in Borno state have forced global attention to the impact of terrorism in the country. In 2014, Nigeria emerged second most terrorized country in the world. Subsequent years after, it has sustained a third position according to the 2019 Global Terrorism Index, GTI. This begs the question, why? I think we have a, an elite and a political class that have decided not to sit together and work together and seek a solution to our problem. Although there are concerns about Nigeria's counter-terrorism approach, the federal government maintains that the insurgent group Boko Haram has been defeated and degraded. Articulated conventional attacks on centers of communication or, and, and uh, population in towns and so on, they are no longer capable of doing that effectively. So I think um, technically we have won the war. This claim is perhaps synonymous with the GTI's report, indicating an 89% decline in the deaths caused by this sect since 2014. But the core argument, which seems to persuade an adverse evaluation of the government's efforts, is the recurring conflict and massacres. A government or its military that does not have the capacity to deal with the security challenges wouldn't be said to be serious. We need to be adequately equipped. How can we explain that a ragtag terrorist organization will continue to attack our military, attack civilians, even to the extent of attacking a sitting governor? Amidst the criticisms, conflict engendered by terrorism has left over 7 million people relying on humanitarian assistance. Other perspectives proffer a drastic change in strategy. The service chiefs, for instance, they have been there. How can you rule out possibility of sabotage, even within the military? That professionalism is now being eroded. Younger officers are retiring, and people are serving 39, 40 years in service. We can, we can move forward like this. Let the president take the bold initiative if the government is really serious about this thing, I think this is the best time to begin to uh, embrace state police so that we can, every state can take ownership. This is the time to also begin to improve on our, our national data so that we know who we are, where we are and what we do. The 2019 Global Terrorism Index report published by the Institute of Economics and Peace place other countries like Syria, Pakistan, Somalia, India and Yemen, amongst others, on the top 10 ranking. <laughs> Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. And the police in Bayelsa State have confirmed that six of its officers have drowned after their boat capsized on their way to Oporoma in southern Ijo local government area of the state. The police public relations officer, Mr. Asinim Butswat, confirmed that the boat was conveying 11 officers when it capsized, though there is no report of any collision with another boat. He says the bodies of the six victims have been recovered while the remaining five officers survived the incident. The officers were on their way to carry out their official assignments during the Bielsa West and Bielsa Central senatorial by-elections that took place yesterday. And the President, Mohamed Buhari, has said that he is pleased with the outcome of the by-elections conducted at the weekend in some states and advised the ruling All Progressives Congress to continue to uphold the spirit of hard work. The President said in a statement that the results showed that the APC was the chosen party of Nigerians and is pleased with the electoral outcome. He urges the party to uphold the spirit of hard work, unity, progress, cooperation that forms the bedrock of these victories. In part two, after the break, Kogi State Governor Yahya Belo calls for caution against another round of NSAR's protests as Lagos police threaten showdown against protesters. Do join us again.
Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on Channels Television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Police killed two suspected kidnappers in a gun battle in Tambawal local government area of Sokoto State. Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, declares results of by-election in 11 states, announces plans to conclude elections in outstanding areas on December the 9th. Six police officers drown after their boat capsizes in southern Ijo local government area of Bayelsa State. And Ghanaians prepare for the polls as President Nanak Akufuado faces main rival and former President John Mahama. <music> to politics. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has announced the result of yesterday's by-election in 11 states across the country. But there are some concerns in some states. This report highlights the outcome of the just-concluded elections across the country. I'm the returning officer for the 2020 Cross River North. We begin in Cross River State where the returning officer has declared Stephen Node of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, as the winner of the 2020 Northern Senatorial by-election in the state. The returning officer announced Dr. Ode as the winner of the by-election conducted across five local government areas of the state. The election became necessary following the death of late Senator Rose Oko, who died in March 2020. Stephen Adi Ode of PDP, having satisfied the requirements of the law, is hereby declared the winner and return elected. In Imo State, Governor Opu Zodima has reacted to the outcome of the Imo North Senatorial District by election, where INEC declared his party, the All Progressives Congress APC, as the winner of the election without returning the party candidate. The governor thanked the people of Imo North Senatorial District for voting overwhelmingly for the APC, noting that the victory has shown once again that Imo State is an APC state. I appreciate also the commitment of our people and resilience in the face of uh, various attempts to distract and confuse our people. They remained uh, committed and uh, voted massively for the party. And uh, we once more shown that Imo State is an APC state committed to the ideas of APC and committed to service and change. Lagos State Governor Babajide Sonwolu has congratulated the All Progressive Congress candidate to Kumba Bureau on his emergence as the senator elect for Lagos East Senatorial District. The governor commended the electorate for coming out to perform their civic responsibilities and for voting in large numbers for the two candidates put forward by the APC. It's really a victory for our people, and, and they are the ones that we need to truly congratulate, you know, for coming out um, in that numbers. In Bochi State, the process was not particularly smooth sail after a mild drama played out in the declaration of results after the PDP agents raised an objection that the winner shouldn't be declared due to the disruption of the process. The session turned rowdy as agents argued back and forth while the returning officer, Professor Ahmed Mohamed, insisted that the process must go on. The APC candidate Bala Ali was eventually declared winner of the keenly contested election. Bala Ali of APC, having certified the requirements of the law, is hereby declared the winner and is returned elected. And the only woman who emerged victorious in the December 5 senatorial by election has been returned elected in Plateau State. INEX returning officer announced that Nora Dadut of the All Progressives Congress pulled 83,151 votes to defeat her closest challenger with a margin of 12,313 votes. Meanwhile, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEX, says it will conclude the by-election for Bakura State constituency in Zampara State on Wednesday, December the 9th. The Commission, in its assessment report of the conduct of last weekend's by-election, condemns what it describes as harassment and assault of its officials. It's promising to not condone further attacks on its staff or destruction of material in future elections. The electoral umpire is warning all those who've 
No business with the conduct of Wednesday's supplementary election to keep away from the 14 polling units affected. The commission has also commiserated with the families of the six policemen who drowned when their boat capsized in Bielsa State. And to the end, SARS aftermath in Kogi State, Governor Yaya Bello is warning against another round of protests which, according to him, some youth are planning to commence across the country from Monday, December the 7th. The governor notes that if the plans are not jettisoned, it's capable of plunging the country into further hardship, including a possible clash with some individuals and the police who are still nursing their wounds from the last protest. I am unsettled by credible intel indicating that another round of NSAS protests are brewing in selected cities across the country, likely to commence this week, and possibly as early as Monday the 7th of December, in other words, tomorrow morning. Every Nigerian should be worried by the specter of another nationwide protest. Any further protest is likely to run into a police force still enraged by the vicious attacks visited upon her last time. I therefore appeal to the Nigerian youth, especially the ANSAS protesters, to rethink all plans for protest at this point. Anger at social imbalance or poor governance manifested only through protest, whether peaceful or violent, will only achieve piecemeal objectives. Our answers, protesters, must therefore start looking and organizing themselves towards the 2023 general elections now. Meanwhile, police authorities in Lagos say they will not fold their arms as some youth plan fresh protests against police brutality and extortion. The state police spokesperson said in a statement, the command is reacting to its awareness that some unpatriotic individuals and groups are planning to embark on the replica of protests. The statement reads in part, the Lagos State Police Command therefore warns those who might want to disguise under NSAR's protests to cause another set of Mayhem, brouhaha, and violence in the state to desist from such plans as the police and other security agencies will not fold their arms, seeing individuals or groups orchestrating violence and anarchy in the state. The statement further asks parents and guardians to warn and discourage their children and wards from being lured into any act, gathering, or protest capable of causing violence in the state. The Emir of Kano, Alaji Aminu Adobayero, is calling for more unity in the country and is asking the citizens to tow the path of peace. The traditional ruler made the comments today when he paid a visit to Lagos State Governor Babajide Samolu. I'm actually here in Lagos to felicitate with uh, my brother, His Excellency the Governor, then the Oba of Lagos, who happens to be a big brother or even a father to me. We are just here to greet them, to bring the goodwill of Kano state government and Kano people. Uh, the long relationship between Lagos and Kano cannot be overemphasized. So whatever happened to Lagos is happening to Kano. Therefore, over the crisis we had a few weeks ago, we find it necessary to come and uh, greet Lagos people, to sympathize with everybody who is here, and to send bring goodwill message from my people generally in Kano. National development, the British High Commissioner to Nigeria, Catriona Lang, has flagged off the construction of a 2.5 megawatt solar electricity supply plant in Igabi local government of Kaduna State with a call for more investment in the power sector for socio-economic development of the country. 
The British High Commissioner explains that energy deficit remains one of the major factors hindering Nigeria's economic growth over the years, pointing out that regular and affordable electricity is a solution for the future. The Nigerian power sector is notable for its significant energy deficit, which has drastically affected the nation's socio-economic development for many years. It is reported that at present, about 80 million people lack access to electricity from the national grid, with the national electrification rate currently at 47%. The situation is worse in rural communities as lack of access to national grid power supply has resulted in about 55% of the population resorting to individual power generation. Yep. This groundbreaking ceremony for the 2.5 megawatt solar hybrid generation site is part of efforts of the Kaduna state government and other stakeholders to transform the power sector in the state and the country at large through a public-private partnership agreement. <laughs> The project is deploying significant investment to improve service delivery to communities around Igabi and Zaria local government areas. Donors to the project include United Kingdom Foreign Office, Commonwealth and Development Office, as well as Climate Fund Managers. We're hoping that there will be additional uh, energy, energy uh, additional electricity generated, especially for the people within this area, from here all the way to Zaria. Uh, then we will also uh, uh, hope that we will see massive employment of the youth and uh, technical and non-technical workers that live around here and that can can benefit from this plant being uh, developed here within this uh, community. Energy is one of the sectors we are focused on, recognizing that no economy can develop without sustainable and secure energy supplies. And I'm very proud to be as a partner of the Kaduna government and the excellent company Connexa, um, which has just won Energy Company of the Future Award from the African Development Bank, who have come up with a really innovative solution, which is a combination of on-grid and off-grid and a way of servicing everybody from the business community to the poorest of the poor making sure that um, people can pay for energy in a sustainable way. This integrated approach requiring an investment of approximately 50 million dollars will enable rural communities who currently cannot rely on electricity distribution companies have access to regular power supply. When the news at 10 returns, residents of Umweze Oga community in Aguata local government of Anambra State cry out for help as erosion continues to threaten their livelihood. Please stay with us. Residents of Umweze Oga community in Agwata, local government of Anambra State, are pleading with the Anambra State government to urgently intervene concerning the erosion menace ravaging their town. More than 20 families have been sacked from their homes while farmland not spared. And the police say, the people say, if desperate measures are not taken, the area may be completely lost to erosion. Anambra State, Southeast Nigeria, is ranked among the smallest in the country with a landmass of 4,844 square kilometers. The presence of over 1,000 active erosion sites has shrunk further available land, putting pressure on several communities and residents in arms way. Only recently, the state government embarked on some remediation work at the cost of over 4 billion naira in Inewi Industrial City when the 100 foot road was hit by erosion. With several more communities set to be worked on, Umezi Uga residents are seeking attention as well. We are going and we are crying. Come to our head. We have, we have voted somebody. Let the person come and help us. For over seven years, they've battered this gully erosion threat, which has continued unabated and left their community almost deserted. Within a day, this one happened. Imagine what will happen in two weeks' time, which means the primary school, it will swallow a lot of them, the markets, the churches, 
all of them did because it's going with the drainage channel. So it may be it may reach about one kilometer in the next two weeks. On investigation, we found out that more than eight communities, wherever there is rain there, you see the rain coming here. Whether there is rain here or not. Prominent sons and daughters of Umwe's Yuga community have recorded losses which they can't stomach any longer. This is the house of a retired controller of prisons. Let if you look behind, you will see his grave. The grave is almost inside the inside the inside the pit. The father's grave, the mother's grave. Nobody is uh, talking about that one, those ones again. They have all even well, they have been washed away for a very long time. The most they could do is carry out palliative measures to save what is left of their farmlands, roads, and other infrastructure. This barely scratches the surface of the magnitude of work to be done in Umwezuga, and the government appears ready to take on the challenge. In Umwezuga, we have a big erosion, gully erosion site. Uh, we send a consultant to design it, and like uh, His Excellency will always say, uh, gully erosion is a problem in a number of states. So Umwezuga, I tell them to be patient. This dry season, we are going to do that because the contractor, I had a series of meetings with the contractor in this my office and we agree that something must be done. While Anambra state government steps up to its responsibility of ensuring a safe environment for the people, any ecological assistance to reclaim lost lands will no doubt be a welcome development. The Socio-Economic Rights and Accountability Project, SERAP, has sent an open letter to President Mohamed Buhari asking him to urgently instruct the National Pension Commission to use its statutory powers to stop 36 state governors from borrowing or withdrawing 17 trillion naira from the pensions funds purportedly for infrastructure development. SERAP said in a statement that it would not be detrimental to the interests of the beneficiaries of the funds if governors have access to it, especially given the vulnerability of pension funds to corruption in Nigeria and the transparency and accountability deficits in several states. It also frowns at decisions by governments to target pension funds as an escape route from years of corruption and mismanagement in ministries, departments and agencies, which is contrary to the spirit of the 1999 Constitution and the Pension Reform Act, even as many pensioners are yet to receive their adequate payments. Sarap adds that the borrowing will be ultimately denying the pensioners the right to an adequate standard of living and trap more pensioners in poverty rather than devising ways to address pensioner poverty. Nigeria's macroeconomic challenges this year have attracted much attention owing to the socioeconomic headwinds that have negatively impacted the slow but sustained growth witnessed since the 2016 recession. Mixed reactions have trailed the policy formulation and implementation of both the fiscal and monetary authorities towards taming the rising inflation. In this report, we'll look at the inflationary trend and what the government is doing to address the issues. Prices of food items, commodities and services such as tomatoes, rice, yams, onions, gary, transportation and fuel have surged from a year ago, threatening the purchasing power of the average Nigerian who lives below $2 a day. That's at the current official exchange rate of 395 Naira. The country is currently battling with high inflation rate, slow economic growth, with unemployment remaining steadily high, a quadrilemma known as stagflation. It is better for us to look at attacking inflation from a supply side. Supply side how? Offer low interest rate to people. Offer low interest rate to corporates. Offer low interest rate to small businesses. So they can go to business, they can go to work. Call it a tactical approach by the central bank to tame inflationary pressures that has risen from 12.13% in January this year to 14.23% in October. The question on the lips of many is how did we get here in the first place? From the prolonged border closure to the coronavirus pandemic, rising insecurity, coupled with new policies introduced at the peak of negative economic growth, 
Many believe it's adding salt to the economic injury. You will discover the implementation of the reflective, uh, the reflective tariff was implemented, which led to about almost 60% increase in electricity tariff. The land border closure is also a major pressure point. What is crucial to Nigerians is to survive a year ravaged by challenges that have once again forced the country into a recession. But what needs to be done to achieve the needed growth? If we want growth, then what that tells me is that this is not a time for us to worry about inflation. Because in economic management, there is always a trade-off between growth and inflation. For the fiscal authorities, measures have been put in place with the result most likely to reflect early next year. Our expectations of a quick exit, which must be historically, which will be historically fast, is anchored on the several complementary real, uh, fiscal, real sector and monetary interventions that have been proactively introduced by government to forestall a far worse decline of the economy. With attention tilting towards growth, many are hopeful that inflation figures will drop to single digits, which was last recorded in January 2016 at 9.62%. President Muhammadu Buhari's plan to lift 100 million Nigerians out of poverty in 10 years seems to be gaining traction as the government initiates special cash grants for rural women in Nigeria. Over 1,000 rural women in Imo State have now joined their counterparts in other parts of the country to benefit from this gesture. Our correspondent, Eitope Kuti, reports. For some people, the sum of 20,000 Naira might be insignificant. But for these women gathered in this hall, it means a lot. One after another, both young and old, drawn from the 27 local government area of Imo State, step out to receive the sum of 20,000 Naira from the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development, Sadia Umar Farouk. It is the flag off of the federal government's special cash grant for rural women in Imo State. According to the minister, the grant is one of President Muhammadu Buhari's social inclusion and poverty reduction agenda for women in the rural areas across the country. We have been disposed to over 150,000 poor rural women across the 36 states of the Federation and the Federal Capital Territory. The grant is expected to increase access to financial capital required for economic activities of this very special uh, rural woman. Some of the beneficiaries say the gesture by the federal government will go a long way in helping them in the micro and small scale businesses. It's good for me. I will use it and add for my business. I didn't expect it. And I'm very grateful and I thank the people that have given Muhammad Bahari. We have thanked him and the, the ministers that came yesterday. We thank him. We are very, I'm very grateful for it. The disbursements continued at designated points across the 27 local government areas of Imo State with a target of a minimum of 1,000 rural women. According to the federal government, about 100 million Nigerians are expected to be lifted out of poverty by the year 2030 with a special cash grant. Eji Topakutei, Channels Television News. To agricultural empowerment in Nasarawa State, 4,000 youth there are to benefit from the state government and Nigeria Incentive-Based Risk-Sharing System for Agricultural Lending Nursal Youth Agricultural Empowerment Scheme. The scheme, built to be expanded in the 2021 farming season, has 430 graduates as beneficiaries of the 2020 season, which is the pilot. While the pilot season has only Benny seeds cultivated, the next season will be extended to other farming categories. Our correspondent, Halim Agayam, has a report. Youth binding bundles of Benny seeds as they prepare for harvest. This is the result of a partnership between the Nasarawa state government and the Nigeria incentive based risk sharing system for agricultural lending NISO aimed at tackling youth restiveness. 430 of them, all graduates, 
from Duma local government area are beneficiaries of the pilot project tagged the Nasrawa State Government NISO Youth Agricultural Empowerment Scheme. Governor Abdullah Isuli and officials of NISO are on the farm in preparation for the 2021 farming season. The beneficiaries share their thoughts on the 2020 Beni Seeds cultivation. Okay. Uh, because of uh, one or two challenges we faced, but uh, we, what we got here, we're actually surprised because we thought it would be worse than this. Not discouraged, the governor makes a request for the upskill of the next project. One thing that I will have love will be something like 4,000 uh, youth, not 400. So that is the dream we have. So An executive have director of NISOL grants his request immediately. We are ready to upscale and the commitment that we have been able to get from His Excellency and the GM if they can actually give us enough land, good land, according to His Excellency, saying that he's going to give a very strong focus to this community. The governor moves to the traditional ruler of Duma to seek support for the success of the next project. With optimism of the next batch being better, of Nasule hints on plans to acquire yields. In Doma local government, I've been able to own the new system of agriculture that we have here. And within this twin tripod of learning process, sir, by the time we move into the next rainy season in which this pilot scheme has given us a good framework to start with, I believe we're going to do better. Instead of allowing people from outside to be buying, maybe we should go and buy some of these crops because we're in a position to do that. So we should buy them and keep and then wait when it is the right time to sell. Then we will sell at a much reduced prices, you know, so that our people will be able to have something to do. Although the next farming season is around no the corner, the state governor like and his partners problem. are assuring a better yield in 2021, which translates to making 4,000 young persons self-reliant. Halima Gayam, Channels Television News. To technology, Nigeria's contribution to global crude markets will soon be replaced with export of technology solutions as the country continues to ensure an enabling environment for techpreneurs. This projection was made by Vice President Yemi Oshibajo during the Art of Technology Lagos 2.0, organized by the Eco Innovation Center and Lagos State Government. Speaking virtually, the Vice President emphasized the need to ensure proper penetration of broadband internet to enable techpreneurs flourish in their endeavors. Our technology correspondent, Victor Matthias, reports. Cities around the world are adopting technologies that will ensure they book their place as smart city initiatives set in around the world witnessing the fourth industrial revolution backed by innovation and technology. In order not to be left out, Lagos State on a yearly basis brings industry experts together to brainstorm on how it can achieve this feat. For us as a government, we've developed what we call a smart city agenda. And in that our smart city agenda, young forward-looking Nigerians everywhere in the world can indeed come together right, and create you know, a city that is not only resilient, but a city that works truly for all of us. For the vice president, the exports of the next decade lies in the hearts and minds of techpreneurs. It's now evident that within the next decade, Nigeria will cease to be a country whose main contribution to the world is crude oil. The resources that we have, which are in increasingly high demand globally, are your capacity for innovation, your imagination, your creative content, and your highly adaptive solutions. Your minds and workspaces are the refineries of the present and the future. Governor Sawo Lu unveils Startup Lagos, a platform to avail entrepreneurs the springboard to global success in years to come. There is very little knowledge about the dynamics of that ecosystem. But with Startup Lagos, people can begin to go to that platform and see, okay, this is what uh, the ecosystem is like. These are the most promising sectors. This is how much funding that has been raised. Oh, this particular startup is in this agri-tech or ed-tech. So this is where I can put my money. So we expect higher investment outcomes from the local uh, 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 markets with Startup Lagos. The Eco-Innovation Centre Partners um, is big um, and highly focused on civic tech. And, and that's why we have a very strong partnership with Lagos State uh, to curate and bring together uh, the actors in the ecosystem with the policy makers and see how we can move Lagos forward. 
Governor Son Olu says, though the implementation of the Lagos Innovation Plan is still a work in progress, he remains optimistic that the techpreneurs in Nigeria will soon compete with their peers globally. Victor Mathias, Channel Television News. President Trump's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, who's been traveling the country raising unsubstantiated claims of voter fraud, has tested positive for COVID-19. President Donald Trump announced this on his Twitter handle, saying, The greatest mayor in the history of New York City, and who has been working tirelessly, exposing the most corrupt election by far in the history of the U.S., has tested positive for the China virus. Here's more on this and other developments on our global update. The U.S. has seen record infections in recent days with a daily death toll of more than 2,000. The latest surge in cases is putting strain on hospitals, with large parts of the state of California now under new lockdown restrictions. Meanwhile, states are also preparing to distribute a vaccine with possible approval approaching. The Food and Drug Administration says its meeting to discuss the U.K.-approved vaccine made by Pfizer on Thursday and will discuss approval of a second vaccine made by Moderna on December 17th. Over in the UK, Britain is preparing to become the first country to roll out the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine this week. The first doses are set to be administered on Tuesday, with the National Health Service giving top priority to vaccinating the over 80s, frontline healthcare workers and care home staff and residents. South Korea has raised its COVID-19 alert levels as it battles a rise in infections. Gatherings of more than 50 will be banned in the capital Seoul and surrounding areas from Tuesday, while gyms and karaoke bars will be closed. On Sunday, 631 new infections were reported in one day, the highest number in nine months. And finally, Pope Francis says the Christmas season provides reason for hope amid the difficulties of the coronavirus pandemic. During his Sunday blessing, the pontiff says there's no pandemic or no crisis that can extinguish this light. Voters in Ghana will head to the polls on Monday to choose the country's next president in what is expected to be a tight race between incumbent Nana Akufuado and his predecessor, John Mahama. The two longtime rivals who are squaring off for the third straight time as they seek a second and final term are widely seen as the two frontrunners in a crowded field of 12 candidates. Campaigning has largely focused on the economy, infrastructure development, and the handling of the COVID pandemic, the fight against corruption, is also featured prominently in the lead-up to the election. The two leading candidates on Friday signed a pact for good conduct and peaceful elections in a ceremony in Accra that was attended by traditional and religious leaders, as well as international observers. Officials say some 63,000 military and paramilitary officers have been deployed across the country to maintain peace during the process and respond to any potential unrest. Talks between the UK and the EU resumed in Brussels today as negotiations, negotiators attempted to resolve their remaining issues and secure a post-Brexit trade deal before a December 31st deadline. UK Chief Negotiator Lord Frost and his new EU counterpart Michel Barnier returned to the negotiating table after an hour-long call on Saturday between the British Prime Minister and European Commission President in which they agreed on a final push to get an agreement. In a last-ditch attempt to strike a Brexit trade deal and avert a chaotic parting of ways at the end of the year, British and EU negotiators are in Brussels for talks. We're going to be working very hard to try and get a deal. We're going to see what happens in negotiations today and we, we will be looking forward to meeting our European colleagues later on this afternoon. It comes after British Prime Minister Boris Johnson and European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen spoke on Saturday and instructed their teams to resume talks after they were paused a day earlier due to an impasse over three issues, fishing, fair competition and ways to solve future disputes. With time running out, 
The UK says there is still a deal to be done, but the issues need to be resolved. Unless we can resolve the, these quite fundamental uh, divergences at the moment, then uh, you know we, we are going to have to uh, take a position in the next few days. Since Britain formally left the EU on January 31st, negotiators have missed a series of deadlines to reach a deal with the world's largest trading bloc before a transition period ends on December 31st. If they fail to reach a deal, a five-year Brexit divorce will end messily just as Britain and its former EU partners grapple with the economic cost of the COVID-19 pandemic. We begin with football. Unlike other football leagues across the world, the 2020-2021 NPFL season is still to start in spite of the lifting of COVID restrictions on contact sports in Nigeria. This report highlights the challenges teams are facing as the waiting train game continues. Of the watch, they started their league uh, for the past three to four months, I think. But the major problem now is Nigeria is the league have not even have the Definitely. 53 days has passed since the federal government paved the way for the return of the MPFL after the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 lifted restrictions on contact sports. Not long after, the league management company, the LMC, proposed any time from November the 15th as kickoff date. Despite its endorsement by the Nigeria Football Federation, the league has not yet started and there is no official word on when it will. Yeah, I think it's a problem because uh, once you have a date set, we start our preparation, our, our mindset to the league. But now we're just training and we don't know what's happening. We don't know if, when the league starts, if it's next year, this year. So I don't think that's good. In, in football, that's what we call uh, periodically uh, time. So that's a time you need to prepare your team, you know, mentally, physically, aspect of the game before you go into the tactical or technical aspect. But when you don't even know when the league is going to start, so it will affect the preparation. The issues are not limited to the field of play alone, especially with regards to planning. We went to Djibouti for precision, thinking that the league will resume this weekend. So if not because of uh, that, uh, that power, financially, you know, that thing may cause us a problem. Despite all the uncertainty, Teams are carrying on with their preparations, recruitment is ongoing and everyone is staying ready like scouts for whenever it's go time. AIMA International have advanced to the next round of the CAF Champions League after a 1-0 draw against Burkina Faso's Rahimo at the Enyimba Stadium in Aba earlier this evening. The People's Elephants had won the first leg by a lone goal, progressing 2-1 on aggregate and will face Sedan's al Marik in two-leg clash with the winner, qualifying for the group phase of the competition. It was also good news for the country's CAF Confederation Cup representatives, Rivers United, who are also through to the next round. The Port Harcourt-based team defeated Futuro Kings of Equatorial Guinea 2-1, the games had to be decided on penalties after the first ended with the same scoreline. Rivers United won the spot kicks 2-0 to progress and will face South Africa's team Celtics for a place in the group phase. And in the English Premier League, Sun and Harry Kane were the stars of the North London derby yet again as Tottenham went top of the Premier League table after beating Arsenal 2-0 in front of 2,000 fans. Spurs' clinical counter-attack in display over their first rivals sees Jose Marino's side go two points clear at the top of the table at the time. Arsenal, meanwhile, extended their winless league run to four matches as the pressure continues to mount on the manager, Mikel Arteta. Jamie Vardy struck a 90th-minute winner to, grab, to give Leicester a 2-1 victory at Sheffield United, leaving Chris Wilder's men in all kinds of trouble at the Premier League. Crystal Palace east to a 5-1 victory over 10-man West Brom at the Hawthorns in the early kickoff. And the main news again. The police today announced that they killed two suspected kidnappers in a gun battle in Tambuwa local government area of Sokoto State. Also today, 
The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, announced the results of yesterday's by-elections in 11 states. The commission also announced plans to conclude elections in outstanding areas on Wednesday, December the 9th. That's it on the news at 10 tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Alun Dia McCauley. Do have a good night and a good week.